Order. The sitting is resumed, and it is time for questions to the Minister of Justice. And we will begin with 30 minutes of oral questions, followed by 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Ms. Michelle McElveen. Ms. McElveen. Principal Deputy Speaker, it is very important for me as Minister and for my department as a whole that the PSNI and other criminal justice agencies are adequately resourced to bring those responsible for the murders of the disappeared to justice. I will continue to work with colleagues at the Executive to ensure that sufficient funding is made available to them. Anyone with any information, no matter how small, should pass this on to the relevant authorities. It is important that every effort is made to help ease the terrible ongoing suffering of these unfortunate families. Thank you and thank the Minister for his answer. With the finger blame being pointed very firmly in the direction of Sinn Féin President Gerry Adams, from Beyond the Grave by Brendan Hughes and from Among the Living by Billy McKee, will the Minister join with me in calling for the Sinn Féin President to provide the authorities with the information they need to give the families of the disappeared the peace they need and allow the bodies of the disappeared to be buried with dignity? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I cannot point the finger at any individual, whether the President of Sinn Féin or anywhere else, but I do, I do however, repeat the words on the 5th of November by the Taoiseach in the Dáil when he said that somebody ordered that Jean McConville be murdered, somebody instructed that people take her away, someone instructed to Laws Price to drive the vehicle used to cross the border, and some, someone gave the instruction in respect of what happened. Whoever has any information, whatever that may be, whatever office they may now hold, has an absolute duty to do all they can to assist in the recovery of those who have disappeared. Again, I'll call Tom Elliott for supplement. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for that, and I do appreciate uh, his issue around additional funding uh, can be provided. Uh, but is there any other investigative process that can be progressed by the Department of Justice or the Police Service of Northern Ireland in relation to this, even on a cross-border basis with the, the Gerda Shikana? Well, I appreciate Mr Elliott's question. I mean, certainly it is up to the PSNI and Gerda Shikana to pursue criminal investigations with whatever evidence they have. We have the role of the Independent Commission for the re Recovery of Victims, uh, who also have their specific duties to follow up in terms of recovery of the bodies. But really what is essential is that anybody who has any information whatsoever that might help in that recovery or in the prosecution of the perpetrators should provide it. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. Would the Minister agree it's quite clear that in the murder of Jean McConville, it was the product of a very elaborate and extensive conspiracy. And therefore, there are many aspects of that case to be investigated, which would include not just those who perfected the murder, but those who conspired to that end, and those who since have uh, withheld information about it. What confidence can the House have through the Minister that all those various persons involved are being rigorously pursued, or is it a situation just, where no one wants to disrupt the process? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, if Mr Allister is suggesting that the PSNI, the PPS and indeed their colleagues on the other side of the border are not doing all they can to deal with serious crime, I think he's making a mistaken assumption. I have no evidence to believe that everything that can be done is not being done at this stage. But we also have to reflect on the fact that we're talking about very difficult circumstances of many years ago. I repeat the point that somebody knows who carried out these actions and anybody who has the information which would help recover the victims should provide it. I call Mr John McAllister. Question number two, Deputy Speaker. I am informed of any complaints received by my office from individuals or their elected representatives in respect of the conduct of members of the judiciary. To safeguard the principle of judicial independence and the effective operation of the justice system, I have no authority to address complaints about judicial office holders. Any complaints of this nature are referred to the Office of the Lord Chief Justice, as he has sole statutory responsibility for determining complaints about the conduct of judicial office holders. Call Mr. McAllister for supplement. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, further to that, uh, the Minister will be aware, having uh, presumably agreed to the Pledge of Office himself, 
But if he looks at um, 1.4 CC, where a minister is to uphold the rule of law based on fundamental principles of fairness, impartiality, democratic accountability, including the support for policing and the courts, could I ask the minister if he believes the health minister is in breach of the pledge of office when he questioned whether he would get a fair uh, hearing in the Court of Appeal? Absolutely different question, but I leave it to the Minister's discretion. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I can only say that the issue of the operation of the Ministerial Code is not something for me to police on behalf of uh, this Assembly or the Executive. Um, it is certainly a case that Ministers collectively, and specifically in the issue he highlights, the Health Minister, may wish to reflect on recent comments he made about the independence of the judiciary, but it is not for me to determine on behalf of any other body what his action should be. Mr Paul Given. Principal Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware of the evidence provided to the Justice Committee by His Honour Judge Marinan, uh, where he said that NIJAC acted irrationally, unfairly and illegally when it came to the appointment of a High Court judge. Uh, what concern does the Minister have? Uh, based on that evidence that was provided to the committee in, uh, about the way in which NIJAC operates, given that its chairman is the Lord Chief Justice? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm certainly aware of the meeting uh, which uh, the Justice Committee had, uh, which appeared to take a significant length of time taking evidence from Judge Maranan. Um, however, the issue of NIJAC as an NDPB is not one for the Department of Justice since it's actually sponsored by OFM DFM. I am concerned that there appears to be a breakdown relationship between Judge Marin and, and other members of the judiciary, uh, but it is not for me to go into the detail of that, and it is certainly something I would be interested to see what the Justice Committee determines in its current consideration of the issues relating to the appointment process. Mr Samuel Gardner. Thank you. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, may I ask, has the Minister any plans to review the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission? Well, no, Principal Deputy Speaker, as I've just said, uh, the NIJAC is a body, uh, an arm's length uh, NDPP of OFM DFM, so it is not for me to consider review of it. Mr. Fran McCann is not in his place. I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, question for him, Principal Deputy Speaker. Principal Deputy Speaker, there are a small number of disaffected people on both sides of the community seeking to take Northern Ireland back to the past. We have seen their recklessness and willingness to endanger life, whether that is through acts of terrorism, organised criminality or through public disorder. The term dissident republicans is well understood. I used the term dissident unionists in a reply to Alba McGuinness at the last Justice Orals to refer to those unionists who also engage in criminal behaviour and do not accept the current political arrangements. Neither group of dissidents can be allowed to thwart the progress that Northern Ireland has made. They need to see the futility of their violent actions and to pursue exclusively peaceful means. Nobody engaged in democratic politics should do or say anything that would encourage the dissidents. Before calling Sydney Anderson, could I just inform the House that question five has been withdrawn? Sydney, your supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, President Deputy Speaker, the term dissident unionist is offensive to law abiding unionists, and it, I would wish uh, you to put it beyond all doubt and confirm that you do not regard those engaged in legitimate peaceful protests, such as those uh, on the flags issue and the ongoing protests at Twadell Avenue, as dissident unionists, and that we must all be very careful in the, our choice of words. Yeah. Thank you. Principal Deputy Speaker, I regard those who break the law, whether or not they yeah. claim to be peaceful, as dissident. Yeah. Oh, I call Mr John Dallet. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I, my question has almost become superfluous because I think the, the Minister has made it absolutely clear. Does he agree with me that those involved in loyalism who are causing disorder and mayhem are in fact dissidents? Well, Mr Dallet has correctly identified the way in which I used the phrase last time, the way in which I have used it again today, and I believe that people need to be very careful if they sit here with a democratic mandate that they do nothing to encourage such yeah. dissidents. Yeah. And I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Question number six. Principal Deputy Speaker, the family of Columba McVeigh have suffered greatly throughout the last 38 years. 
and it is a matter of great sadness that both his parents have passed away without being accorded the dignity of giving their son a Christian burial. His family, and indeed the families of the other disappeared, are to be commended for their continued efforts to establish the truth behind those events that led to the death of their loved ones. The Independent Commission for the Location of Victims Remains is the body established to help in these cases. I would encourage anyone who has any information that would help in any way to bring an end to the suffering of these families to make that information known to the relevant authorities. I, I thank the, the Minister for his answer and indeed <clears throat> those who carried out any such form of nefarious abduction, murder and subsequent burial. It has to be one of the worst abuses of the civil rights of our civil rights that has ever existed. Uh, could I ask the Minister, following on from his question, would he be prepared to meet with the McVeigh family or their representatives? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have met in my time as Minister a number of uh, families, those who were bereaved or those who were suffered in other ways in various aspects of criminal activity and terrorism over the years. I am quite happy to extend that to the McVeigh family and their representatives. Well, Lord Morrow, for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the uh, Minister's answer and, and the assurance that he has given to the House today. I wonder could he just go a little bit further and further reassure the House that he, in particular, and his department are doing everything that they possibly can to have a resolution uh, of the nightmare that the McVeigh family ha have gone through for these numerous years. As one who has met with the family, I am acutely aware of the sorrow and grief that they uh, are experiencing. And I think that if the minister was to go the second mile on this, and I am not saying he is not, but if he can do that, I think it would bring some degree of reassurance to that family. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I certainly take Lord Morrow's point. I'm not sure that there is much that can be done by my department as opposed to by agencies like the PSNI and Garda Shikana in terms of dealing with the specific concerns they have, but I'm certainly prepared to meet the family and see if there is anything that they would wish that can be done by my department. Yeah. Call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could, could I ask the Minister if a meeting with his colleagues from the Republic of Ireland, the issue of the disappeared appears on the agenda regularly? We well, know, Principal Deputy Speaker, the issue of the disappeared does not appear regularly on the agenda for IGA meetings with my colleague, the Minister of Justice and Equality. But certainly, the ongoing issues of terrorism do feature in terms of looking at a joined up approach across the island. And the issue of ensuring that we fight criminality in all its various forms is part of the issue. The specific responsibilities, of course, of the recovery of remains are not for my department specifically but ongoing issues as to how we address these problems are very much part of our concern. Mr Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question uh, 7. The Prisoner Ombudsman's report into the death of Colin Bell was published in January 2009 and made 44 recommendations. The Northern Ireland Prison Service accepted 43 of these recommendations and they have all been addressed. The Prison Service takes its responsibility for the safe custody of all those in its care extremely seriously, and the safety and care of vulnerable prisoners continues to be a priority. Every death in custody represents a personal tragedy for someone, and lessons can be learned in every case. I am satisfied that the Prison Service has made significant progress in this respect and has implemented a number of measures to deal with the serious failings identified in the Ombudsman's report. Mr. Jimmy Spratt for supplementary. The Minister will be aware that in relation to uh, some of the recommendations uh, in re relation to procedures that a number of prison orders uh, were in actual fact uh, charged by the PSNI, in fact used as scapegoats by the PSNI and the prison service. Uh, will he look at that given the fact that at least one of these men was suffering from cancer at the time and caused on due and added stress? To a person already seriously ill? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I cannot accept that an appropriate disciplinary response could be regarded as scapegoating. I am also very aware that there is a criminal case before the courts today on this issue, and I would be unwise to say anything more on the issue. Thank you. I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer, indeed, can I reassure him that the Justice Committee 
like you think we give significant time to all the witnesses that appear in front of our committee. We don't select particular ones and give them more attention than the other. But in relation to the, the death of Colin Bell in, in McGabry, does the Minister agree that it was a death that could have been and should have been avoided? Um, just briefly to refer to Mr McCartney's opening remarks, certainly um, any session with any individual witness which lasts longer than an entire executive meeting does seem to me to be a fairly significant contribution. The, yeah, the, the serious point that he raises about the death of Colin Bell, clearly the recommendations made by the Ombudsman, the implementation of all but one of those recommendations by the prison service is an indication that the death should not have happened, that Colin Bell should not have died and that there were serious issues to address in terms of how vulnerable prisoners are cared for. I believe that those lessons are being learned, but we are also well aware that prisons in every part of the world will see deaths in custody. What we need to do is to do all we can to eliminate them. Call Mr Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr Prince, Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his, for his reply. Could I ask the Minister um, uh, what further steps have been taken to assist prisoners who have mental health issues? to ensure they get effective treatment for their illness? Well, I can assure Mr Rogers that the issue of mental health is one which is being taken very seriously at the moment. Um, a number of the recommendations from the, the prison review team, Dame Anna Oz and her team's uh, recommendations, included specific aspects of health care, including mental health care. At the last meeting of the oversight group, we had a detailed response from the South Eastern Health and, uh, Health and Social Care Trust in terms of the work that was being done there, and the Permanent Secretary of DHS SPS sits on the oversight group to ensure that those lessons are being learned. Indeed, only earlier today, I was discussing the ongoing issues of health care with the Director General of the Prison Service. So there is a lot of work to be done that is fully acknowledged, but that work is underway. And I call on Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you. Just to follow on from Mr Rogers' question and uh, the Minister's answer, could he then, for, uh, uh, on foot of his discussions, as he's just outlined, tell us how much is being spent on health care in the prison system and what proportion is being spent on mental health issues? Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid Mr Nesbitt will have to ask the Minister for Health, Social Services and Public Safety that question. I call Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number eight. The Northern Ireland Policing Board has responsibility for appointing independent members to policing and community safety partnerships and the four Belfast District PCSPs in line with the requirements of a statutory code of practice issued by my department under the Justice Act of 2011. Following appointment, independent members can be removed if, for example, they fail to disclose a conviction or have demonstrably acted in breach of the terms of declaration against terrorism and or they are convicted of a criminal offence. In line with the requirements of the 2011 Act, responsibility for removing independent members rests with the policing board or the relevant council with the approval of the board. I call Mr Alvin McGuinness for a supplementary. I, I thank the Minister for his reply, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. But what the Minister is actually saying is that uh, he has no power in terms of removal policing board has some power, but is it not a scandal that uh, a well-known member of an illegal organisation now sits on the Belfast uh, policing board? Is that not something which ordinary members of the public would right, rightly object to? Well, uh, I need to be cautious about referring to whether somebody is or isn't a member of an illegal organisation and which individual may be referred to by Mr McGuinness. But certainly the arrangements for removal are quite clear. If somebody has demonstrably failed uh, to uphold the declaration against terrorism which they made on appointment to the PCSP or the district PCSP, that is the way the law is currently formulated. That is as was put through this House. Uh, if there were changes to be made uh, regarding vetting prior to, you know, prior to appointment, they would have to be considered by this House at a later stage. But I certainly understand the concerns which are being expressed by Mr McGuinness if that is the feeling of sections of the community about some individual members. And the key issue is to ensure that we see all members of PCSPs acting to uphold their responsibilities, acting lawfully, 
upholding the rule of law and the democratic institutions of the state. And I call Ms. Rosalind McCarley. I thank the Minister for his answers up to this point. Um, in light of recent uh, events in Coleraine and East Belfast, can I ask the Minister what discussions he's had with the Chief Constable in respect of illegal loyalist activity and the status of the UVF ceasefire? Gurum I Ogut. Totally separate question and it's at the Minister's discretion. Um, I think we need, we need to be careful how we actually handle those particular issues. The specific matter of a UVF ceasefire or lack of a UVF ceasefire, um, issues of specification of the organisation, are not for the Department of Justice, but they remain with the Secretary of State. But the member and others will appreciate that naturally, when I meet the Chief Constable, I discuss a range of issues which include criminal and terrorist activity. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Yes, Deverney. Question then. Come Principal Deputy Speaker, the figures for referrals of potential victims of human trafficking to the national referral mechanism can fluctuate, and in Northern Ireland, where the numbers of referrals are rel is relatively low, any fluctuation, for example, whether there are multiple referrals from a single case, can have a disproportionate effect on the figures. In addition, the clandestine nature of human trafficking makes it very difficult to assess with any degree of certainty the real level of the crime. The level in 2012 was less than in 2011, but there is already an increase in 2013. One factor in recognising victims is the need to raise awareness of the issue and how to recognise its signs with both frontline professionals and the wider public. The cross-border forum on human trafficking, which my department co-hosted with the Irish Department of Justice and Equality last month, looked at the challenges of identifying victims of human trafficking. Key messages emerging from that forum reinforced the need for training and awareness the importance of a multi-agency approach, the role of education, and the need to build victims' trust and confidence in both the criminal justice system and in the statutory bodies that can help them. My department is working with partners to address these issues. Progress includes the launch of an education resource and support for a number of awareness-raising campaigns and events. Training of frontline professionals has been prioritised by the Organised Crime Task Force, and my department has produced a leaflet to inform victims of how and where help can be accessed. The OCTF has also commissioned research on referrals from Northern Ireland since the NRM was established in order that we are better able to understand and respond to both emerging threats and to victims' needs. And I call Mr Sean Lynch for a supplement. And I want to thank the Minister for his uh, answer. Uh, I want to ask him how can the public assist in the campaign against human trafficking? I think, Principal Deputy Speaker, the key way in which the public can assist is by being informed of the issue, being aware of the kind of signs which apply to trafficking, uh, whether it be the trafficking that we see in forced labour, particularly around agriculture and horticulture, whether it be the issue of people living in a house, whether too many people coming and going, an unusual activity which may or may not relate to the sex trade, and further to that, as well as becoming informed people need to be not frightened to make their concerns known to the relevant agencies, normally to the PSNI, to ensure that if there are concerns about people being trafficked, they're followed up at an early enough stage and not left until perhaps people have moved on or other changes have happened. There is no doubt that the numbers we are talking about in Northern Ireland are relatively no, low, but the scale of the, uh, the problem is not the real issue. The issue is the horrendous crime that trafficking is whatever form of trafficking it takes, and the importance that the public is aware, vigilant, and responds. Call the Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I just ask, say to the Minister that there are many issues which him and I disagree with on how to take this matter forward, but there is clear evidence of late that uh, perhaps he has initiated, but the PSNI are taking measures to create awareness of this human trafficking issue right across, uh, well, we needn't say right across Northern Ireland, unfortunately it goes farther than that. Can I ask the Minister, is this but a first step and is, there, is it his intention to take further action to create awareness of this uh, awful scourge of human trafficking? 
Well, I certainly appreciate the work that Lord Morrow is doing, and whilst he may highlight areas where we disagree, we can also highlight significant areas where we agree on the matter. Um, it is certainly my intention through, for example, the engagement group the Department has, working with a number of NGOs, that we continue to highlight the issue. Uh, I think he will have read, if other members haven't read, the report of the IDMG, which was published uh, just at the time of the last meeting, which I attended in London and reported on at the last oral question time, which shows a significant amount of work being done in every region of the UK. I've already highlighted in my primary answer to Mr Lynch the work which we're doing on a north-south basis to cooperate. So yes, it is clear that there is work being done, good work being done, but we require a partnership of the statutory agencies alongside the concerned voluntary groups and individuals to ensure that we get the message out. Diana Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I want to first of all commend the Minister uh, for working so closely with um, his colleagues uh, in, in other jurisdictions uh, in, in order to really ensure a joint up approach. And can I ask the Minister, is he um, looking at the um, Home Office modern slavery bill uh, at the moment uh, that's going through Westminster? And is he looking to see whether there are elements in the bill that could be extended to Northern Ireland or replicated in Northern Ireland? Well, I thank my colleague for that question. I think she's slightly premature. The, the modern slavery bill is not yet introduced in Westminster, but the Home Office is engaging in a number of areas around it. I mean, there's certainly, uh, there are a number of provisions there which, if they apply across the UK, will have relevance for us. I suppose one of the key issues um, which is where, at the moment, there is a slight disagreement, but only a slight technical disagreement between Lord Moore and myself, is the issue about a rapporteur mechanism as to whether there should be a rapporteur for Northern Ireland uh, or whether we fit into a UK arrangement. It seems to me that if the Home Office carries through on the promises it's making in terms of an independent rapporteur for the UK as a whole, uh, then the rapporteur may well be able to fulfil a significant function for Northern Ireland looking at devolved and non-devolved matters which would be beneficial to us, but we really do need to see the detail of what the Home Office is planning, and I will certainly be looking at that as my officials are engaging with the Home Office and engaging with Lord Moore and others as to how we carry that through. Call Mr Stuart Dixon. Question number 10. <laughs> I'm happy to answer Kieran McCarthy as well as Stuart Dixon, Principal <laughs> Deputy Speaker. I am pleased to report that plans for introducing statutory time limits are well advanced and that I intend to shortly launch a public consultation on our proposals. As developed by the Criminal Justice Board, the proposals are to introduce a single time limit for both charge and summons, starting at the commencement of formal proceedings, which is the date a young person is formally charged, or for summons cases, the date the complaint charging the sus suspect is made to the court. Once the time limit has been activated, Justice agencies will have 120 days to reach the start of trial. This time limit would apply to around 70% of the processes which we currently measure in the justice system. When I announced in February 2012 that I plan to introduce STLs, I assured members that any proposals would include specific safeguards to protect victims and the interests of justice. I am therefore proposing to exclude certain serious offences from the scope of the STLs, with a particular focus on offences involving children or vulnerable adults. In addition, I am proposing to provide the Court with powers to extend a time limit in the interests of justice. In developing the consultation, my officials have undertaken an extensive programme of pre-consultation with a range of stakeholders representing a broad spectrum of public groups and organisations with a particular interest in young people. This has been extremely useful in giving us a clear understanding of the issues for young people and their families and of how STLs, along with the wider reforms which I am bringing forward, could make a positive difference in their lives. Mr. Dixon, for a short supplementary. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Minister, you made reference to youth engagement clinics in your original announcement. Can you tell us how those are progressing? Well, youth engagement cl clinics were part of the key work to improve performance prior to the formal introduction of statutory time limits, piloted earlier this year within the Belfast area, and was seen to have significant benefits in diverting cases away from formal proceedings and speeding up the justice system. Uh, we're now seeking to see how they can roll out across Northern Ireland generally.
And order that an end to the period for oral questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. Thank you, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he's satisfied with the current arrangements uh, for consulting with the families of murder victims uh, with regard to the release on licence of perpetrators uh, released on licence by parole commissioners? Well, there's a complex set of arrangements. Uh, which have uh, managed through the uh, Victims Information Scheme, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I believe that those normally work extremely well in ensuring that families are made aware as uh, individuals progress through the system, and particularly in terms of looking at issues like temporary release. Uh, but there are always circumstances in which, in some cases, uh, the information is perhaps not supplied in a way which has been most helpful, and that's an issue which has been currently addressed within the Department. I call Mr Nesbitt for supplementary. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid the Minister's words are probably of little comfort to people like Linda Brown, whose daughter Nicola Dixon was murdered in Ballycarry in 2003, and Linda only discovering that the perpetrator uh, was out on licence by being told that he'd been spotted uh, out and about uh, in the centre of Belfast. So can the Minister expand on what he is doing, and particularly whether he'll a catch up with England and Wales in terms of the Euro Directive on the rights of victims and allow victims to participate in parole hearings? Well, the issue of direct participation by victims in parole hearings is in a different stage. Certainly, uh, Mr. Nesbitt has highlighted one particular issue where there was a problem in that the way the information was supplied around somebody on the third phase of the pre release scheme was perhaps supplied in a way which was not entirely. Uh, easy to understand, and that's the point which I referred to my principal answer about ensuring that matters are dealt with differently. But clearly, this is the kind of an issue which needs to be kept under review as part of the ongoing work with victims and witnesses to ensure uh, that, for example, the joined up uh, issues around the bringing together the three victim information schemes is done in the best possible way to assist uh, victims, whether they be direct victims or those who are bereaved through murder or manslaughter. Call Mr. Alec Maskey. Could I ask the Minister, uh, could he advise the House what options were explored by his department or himself with the PSNI as uh, alternatives, if you like, to the issue of yet another direct award contract to graft and recruitment for agency staff at the end of this year? Uh, well, I can answer to, uh, to Mr. Maskey that unless there is an issue about the department having a formal role of approving a business case because of the fi figures involved, the issue of direct award contracts is an issue for the PSNI uh, to carry out. It is not an issue for the department to directly supervise. Mr. Maskey for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Uh, can I note, first of all, that before I last supplementary, it is very interesting that the Minister will routinely take this approach to every organisation with the exception of the so called National Crime Agency. But notwithstanding that, given the, uh, the ongoing controversy around this lucrative yet non-competitive contract, would the Minister assure this House that his uh, Permanent Secretary will not endorse this particular contract? Well, I can give Mr Maskey and the House an assurance uh, that the correct procedures will be followed by the Department, by the Minister and by the Permanent Secretary. If there is a role for the Minister, it will be carried out properly. If there is a role for the Permanent Secretary, it will be carried out properly. Yeah, and I call Mr Mervyn's story. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Can I ask the, the Justice Minister what progress is being made uh, to ensure that Northern Ireland plays its full part in regards to the National Crime Agency? And rather than having the continual platitudes in this House about trying to go after uh, people who break the law, that when we have the opportunity actually to deal with lawbreakers and bring them to a system whereby they are accountable for their deeds and their ill gotten gain. Uh, is actually something of reality rather than just words? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have certainly told the House on a number of occasions about the engagement which I have had around the National Crime Agency. Um, I continue to believe it is vitally important that we get the full benefits of having the NCA operational in Northern Ireland in the devolved sphere, as well as, of course, its current position active in the non devolved sphere without any oversight from the policing architecture that we have. Um, in the latter part of October, um, indeed on the 25th of October, uh, I wrote to Sinn Féin members um, setting out some responses to questions which had been raised. And on the 22nd of October, 
Um, I was given an undertaking by members of the SDLP uh, to provide me with a paper setting out some of the concerns they have. I remain active and keen to engage around those issues, but at the moment the ball is respectively in the, you know, in the court of those two parties and not with the Department. I can assure the House in general that the Department will respond speedily to any representations made by any party in the House. I call Mr Mervyn Storey for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for clarifying that and obviously it will now be interesting to see what the response of those two parties that talk much about dealing with those who are lawbreakers are right, you prepared to come up with uh, suggestions as to how this vitally important element of uh, our structures against criminality and criminals is implemented. But can, could the Minister uh, give the assurance to the House that it won't just be around the issues of accountability that will be addressed, but it will be real meaningful progress to ensure that Northern Ireland plays its central role in this very important issue to ensure that criminals and their assets are pursued and put out of business. But certainly, Principal Deputy Speaker, that is my intention to ensure that we have the National Crime Agency operating in every respect in Northern Ireland in support of the PSNI and other agencies, <coughs> playing its part in the Organised Crime Task Force alongside other agencies, whether local and devolved or UK-wide agencies operation in Northern Ireland. I believe that should be the ambition for all of us. That has to be done in recognition of the specific policing architecture we have in Northern Ireland, as I've said on many occasions, both in this House and in negotiations with Whitehall ministers. I remain committed to seeing that happen. I welcome the fact that I have had uh, positive comments on that from all parties in this House, and I just hope that we can carry through and get the details sorted out from those who are currently you know, asking questions but haven't responded to the last points I put back to them. I trust that we can do that as speedily as possible. Thank you, and I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the high levels of sick leave within his department and within the Northern Ireland Prison Service? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, Mr Anderson correctly highlights why sick leave is seen as at a high level uh, within the DOJ, because prison officers are classed as departmental employees in terms of the way the statistics are produced. And I think we could all accept that there are circumstances in which somebody who has a relatively straightforward uh, desk-bound policy job might be able to go to work when, with similar sickness, uh, they would be unable to work as a prison officer. That is a large part of why, in fact, that's probably the almost total part of why DOJ uh, absentee figures are higher than the civil service average. It is an issue which is being addressed both in the core department as in other departments and within the prison service itself. But we do have to recognize the circumstances under which prison officers work and accept that their rate of sickness will always be higher than for other staff. Mr. Anderson, for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for, for his response. Uh, Minister, I understand uh, that the Northern Ireland Prison Service predicts a further increase uh, in sick leave in 2013-14. Would you agree with me that sick uh, leave levels are being made worse by the low staff morale at present time caused by the speed and nature of the current prison reform programme? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have no sign that there is low staff morale because of the prison reform programme. Indeed, what I see is with a significant uh, input of new staff, over 300 new staff who joined the service, 200 staff who have been regraded. Uh, into the new custody officer post, that there is a significant impetus to see change happening within the prison service. There are undoubtedly some members who were more accustomed to the difficult duties they had to perform some years ago, for whom that is a challenge. But what I see is significant improvement being made and a solid management leadership which is driving forward the change that this society needs to see. Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the, the Minister if he's aware of the concern um, that, the, that the review in terms of the, the fees for, for solicitors around family law and the reduction, um, is he aware of the concern that that might lead to uh, the closure of some uh, law practices and then subsequently uh, potentially uh, difficulties around access to justice for some people? Well, certainly I am aware that concerns have been expressed by some people of the potential for closure of solicitors' firms. 
but the reality is I have a duty to ensure that the budget which the Department of Justice has is used to provide the justice services this society needs as a whole. Uh, in round figures on devolution, the justice budget was £75 million and expenditure was just over 100. Despite the reforms that have been made to the criminal uh, fees, the, budg the budget at £75 million is still being exceeded with expenditure in the region of £100 million. And every penny which is spent in that respect is money which is not being directed uh, to other services by the Department. When we look at the comparison between fees as they are in this jurisdiction with England and Wales, the most comparable figure, we are spending significantly more on those fees within this jurisdiction, and there is no doubt that that position is unsustainable into the future. Well, Mr. Eastwood for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer. Um, given the real difficulty that law graduates have in terms of finding employment or finding placement in solicitor's office, some people would say because of some of these cuts, um, would the Minister advise young people to go into the legal profession? Well, it's not for me to advise young people on their career choices, except possibly the four uh, young adults who are my children. Um, the, the issue has to be that individuals have to decide for themselves, and there's no doubt that some law graduates have found uh, career opportunities with some of the international legal firms which are now establishing back office services in Northern Ireland. But the reality is uh, other aspects of life have changed in recent years, and I'm not sure that it's my position as Justice Minister to guarantee that small solicitors' firms will continue to operate as they have. What I do also see is a number of lawyers, both solicitors and barristers, looking at different ways in which they could operate, for example, developing alternative dispute resolution services. And the important thing is to see that we get the best possible services for the people of Northern Ireland in an, info, uh, uh, an affordable way and which meets the needs of this society for the next few years. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, given the concerns highlighted by the Public Accounts Committee regarding the awarding of the contract and the way in which it was carried out with respect to the later, have you any concerns about the proposals um, given the fact that the preferred bidder or bidder designate for the Desert Creek College may be the same company? Well, there is not, as I understand it at this stage, Principal Deputy Speaker, either a preferred bidder or a preferred bidder designate. Um, it is certainly my information uh, from the work being done by the Programme Board that robust checks have been carried out on the bidders who might be involved in the final contract. And indeed, the, uh, the COPE within DHSSPS has been carrying out a lot of that work on behalf of the Programme Board. The, you know, the key issue is to ensure that we get Desert Creek College built as fast as possible and meeting the needs of the three services. Thank you. And I call Mr Copeland for a supplementary. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Um, uh, my source of information for that minister was the Justice Committee, where I believe some of your own departmental mm. officials used the term last week. However, given the significant amount of uh, budget overspends that have uh, dogged um, Desert Creek thus far, do you feel that this has a potential to provide further delay and what steps will you take to prevent that? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I believe we have now got matters back on track. There certainly was a problem um, in that the consultants appointed uh, made a very significant error in the estimated costs, and those who were supervising failed to pick up on that error. Um, a lot of work has been done by the programme team, by the two departments, by the three responsible bodies, to look at uh, how costs can be taken out without cutting back on the functionality of the college, and I believe we've now reached that position that we have a scheme which will represent value for money and which can go ahead. I call Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in light, particularly in light of recent events, uh, for his assessment of the current threat posed by dissident Republican terrorists? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, the position remains, as it has been for some time, that the threat from Republican terrorists remains severe which means that attacks are believed to be likely, and clearly we have seen a number of significant attacks in recent weeks. Uh, certainly the uh, use of parcel bombs, which put at risk the lives of a number of people, whoever they may have had uh, addresses to, they were clearly never going to reach the individuals to whom they were addressed, but putting at lives the threat of postal workers and administrative staff in a variety of uh, government and police offices, 
uh, just shows how desperate some people are. The deliberate attempt to murder police officers in Straban this weekend was clearly a sign showing that that threat is being carried through. But what we should also recognise is the extremely good work being done by the PSNI, whether in some of the specialist branches or at community level, in countering that threat. Order, and that ends the, uh, the period for topical questions. The